So hello everyone and welcome to this week's MTD2. Uh, this week we have uh, Mas Benson. Uh, Emma is a PhD student in the research group led by uh, Professor Kreider uh, and uh, at the uh, Johannes Kepler University in Austria. Uh, her background is in engineering, mathematics, and computer science, and she's passionate about the application of deep learning to high impact real world challenges. So thank you, Emma, uh, for joining us and for yours. Yeah, so thank you and hi everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here today to present our recent work that was accepted to the Journal of Chemical Information and Modeling. Um, you can read the paper here if you want. And uh, in this work, we proposed the hyper PCM model that is meant for um, robust task condition modeling of drug target interactions. Um, and yeah, please feel free to interrupt me anytime during the talk with questions or save them for the end. Um, yeah. Um, so first let me um, introduce the general context and uh, explain the problem that we would like to solve with this um, approach. So in drug discovery, um, this is a very long and expensive process that starts with thousands or tens of thousands of molecular compounds um, and sequentially breaks this down to end up with a single uh, FDA approved drug, um, as I'm sure you're um, maybe aware. Um, and in the first step, um, there is a this large number of um, potential molecular compounds needs to be um, screened and tested uh, for numerous different um, properties uh, against a protein target or bioassay that is identified um, for a given um, disease. And the um, efficiency of the high throughput experiments done in um, labs are the bottleneck that determines how many um, compounds can be tested. And with machine learning, we have the potential to make this step um, much more efficient. And this can lead to a greater size of the chemical space being tested, um, as well as in, in turn better um, drug candidates, um, yeah, leading to better drug candidates, and which also can result in a greater chance of success for the clinical trials. Um, and in machine learning, in the machine learning sense, we um, consider this problem um, and we we need to consider, uh, we can consider the protein targets to be the different tasks that we would like to model. And for that reason, we um, need to distinguish between different protein targets based on the amount of training data that is available, um, meaning the amount of experimentally tested labels that are available to us. So for one protein target, if we have a large number of um, drug compounds already tested on the this target, we would consider this a many shot, or we call this a many shot um, task. But if there are instead only few available um, compounds tested, say less than 10, or if there are no available um, compounds tested, we call this few shot or zero shot tasks. And these are of course more difficult, but we would also like our machine learning models to be able to perform in these settings. So in our work, we aim to improve the generalization between different protein targets um, and uh, specifically have highly performant models in the zero shot task. Um, yeah, so initially these, um, these things have been modeled using the quantitative structure activity relationships or QSAR model. Modeling, um, where we have models that take into consideration only the structure of the molecular compound, um, either encoded in, in some way using some neural network or just using handcrafted descriptors or fingerprints. And these models can either model the um, problem in a single task way or just one um, protein target, or it can uh, model the 
monolith, a predefined set of protein targets with like a multitask um, set up like this with a um, vector output. But these models can never make any predictions for unseen or these zero shot predictions for unseen protein targets, because this would mean adding a new dimension to the output here after the model has been trained. So instead, the field of proteochemometrics modeling has come up in more recent years. This field um, takes, uh, lets the model take into account also the information about the protein target, again, um, encoded in some way. And a common approach here is to uh, encode the drug compound and protein target respectively, and then simply concatenate these two embeddings and process them with some model, for example, a fully connected model. Um, one example is the DPCM uh, model, which uses pre-trained encoders for the drug compound and protein target respectively. Um, then, um, yeah, these are frozen and, and not trained during the procedure. Um, and they end up with a model of around 8 million trainable parameters. Um, yeah, but um, but yeah, these uh, models are still, so, so this, this model can now actually make predictions for zero shot tasks, but they are still not um, performing very well in this in this setting for, um, um, yeah, usually. So we, we aim to improve this um, and we take inspiration from um, a field that is called, or a kind of model that are called hyper networks. These are models, these are neural networks that take, um, that make predicted, that, that predicts the parameters of other neural networks. This can also be called parameter prediction. And it's a concept that's actually been around for quite a while uh, with um, different variations. So it started with something called fast weights proposed by Schmidt Huber in the 90s. Then we have dynamic convolutions proposed by Klein and others. And finally, the um, term hypernetworks was coined by Ha and others in 2017. In throughout these different um, projects, they have the they let the hypernetwork take in either a random random noise or perhaps the same input as the main network. Um, or the hypernetwork produced layer-wise um, predictions of the network, and then it took in um, a an index of the index of the layer that it should produce. But where we've seen more um, work done in recent years is to take the hypernetwork and actually um, let it take in information about um, a task. And um, this means that, yeah, the hypernetwork takes in information about the task and based on that produces this main network, which then actually predicts, uh, makes predictions for that task. Um, and it, we've seen um, actually quite a few examples of how this um, uh, works very well for making these kind of zero shot predictions and generalizing between tasks also in low data scenarios where there's um, yeah, not enough data for other approaches to work well. Some examples are in personalized federated learning, um, mixed task multilingual language and natural language processing, uh, as well as neural architecture search. Um, and it might not be uh, completely obvious to you why this um, why we would like to do this or why this should work. But there are actually some um, nice uh, theoretical motivations for, for this approach. So first of all, uh, Yaya Kumar and others um, have shown that with that multiplicative interactions impose an inductive bias that strictly enriches um, representations in neural networks. And what this means in this kind of um, hypernetwork approach is that um, 
we have these multiple um, inputs or multimodal learning. And in the regular concatenated approach, the, these two input sources are basically taken in in the beginning and then um, mixed throughout the neural network. But with this hyper network approach, the task information comes in here and we get these multiplicative interactions in every single layer of the main network. So yeah, according to this theory, um, this actually um, should improve how these uh, different sources are combined. And um, the second theory we have is from Lugosi and Noy. Um, they've shown that there is a relationship between the bounds on the generalization error between um, predictions and ground truth in supervised learning and the mutual information between parameters of a neural network and the training data. And specifically, they, they showed or they derived that um, with a lower mutual information, we have a stricter bound on the generalization error. So in this hypernetwork approach with task condition predictions, we believe that the hypernetwork, which is the only thing that is trained here, it only takes in, into consideration or it's only trained on really the task information. So if you include the entire training data set or information, we actually believe that we have a lower um, mutual information between the trainable parameters and the training data, which then according to this theory in, um, means that we get a strictly equal to or greater um, bound on this uh, generalization error. So now it might be, um, I hope that it's clear that this is kind of the architecture that we end up with or that we have proposed. Um, we have this hyper network and we input the information about the protein target, which is what we consider to be the task. Um, it's encoded um, with, we use also pre-training encoders here. Specifically, we use actually language-based um, encoders in both cases. So we take in the SMILES information for drug compounds and amino acid sequence for the protein target. Um, and then based on this um, task embedding, the hypernetwork um, predicts a long uh, flattened vector of all of the parameters for this other, other model. And these are then um, basically divided up and, and um, inputted here as weights in, in this other model. And this model we can now consider um, a QSAR model because this model is um, meant to only take in the structure of the drug compound and make a prediction of, about the interaction, the interaction properties, but specifically for the protein that it was designed for. And yeah, we see the uh, objective function here of how we train this. Um, so it is actually quite straightforward. The, with the output prediction, we, um, ah, do we have a question? Yes, I was wondering, like, you are not modifying the parameter of the molecule encoder, only the, the predictive head or both? Yeah, exactly. So we just use pre-trained encoders and we never update them uh, in the training. Okay, and how big is the network? Uh, used on top of the encoder? So, yeah, exactly. So the hyper network needs to be quite large because the output vector here, the output of the, the hyper network is, uh, needs to be all of the parameters in, in the main network. So this network is supposed to be quite small, um, but even with a small, say like 20,000 parameters in, in this model, we end up with quite a few Quite a lot of parameters, maybe not in, in, in you know transformer terms. These are smaller models than than all of the transformers, but um, yeah, the, the main network, this this QSAM model is smaller than than other uh, previous approaches, but the hyper network itself is is uh, instead bigger. So it's more more demanding to train 
the, the hyper network. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but then how we train it. So the we we simply train it here with the uh, output predicted interaction, compare it to um, the ground truth interaction um, using a classification or regression loss, and backpropagate this through the QSAR model. We, we backpropagate it through this entire model, um, but we never update this model. Instead, we re redirect the gradients um, and take them back here to the hyper network, and this is where we uh, backpropagate through the network and actually update. So really, the hyper network is the only thing that is trained, um, these layers here. And apart from the idea that this architecture should generalize well between different tasks and transfer information between um, protein targets, um, this also has a great computational advantage um, because um, exactly like we just discussed, the sizes of these models, um, the size of the QSAR model is actually quite small compared to other models. And so once we've trained this, um, if we identify a new protein target, we can input it through the trained hypernetwork and gain access to this smaller, more efficient QSAR model that we can um, more efficiently use to screen a large number of drug compounds. But we, um, but yes, yeah, so this is this is the base. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, there's a question in the chat it's asking if you can describe what the output is, the predicted interaction. Mm -hmm. So the output can be basically whatever you want, whatever kind of interaction you want to model. Um, it can be binding affinity or just um, binary classification of a binding or non-binding interaction, or it could be bioactivity, or you could also model any other molecular properties like toxicity or, um, yeah, basically whatever you are interested in. And really the, the output is just um, the predicted either continuous value or, or binary, um, binary label. Um, yeah, but the point is that it is only for this given um, pair of uh, drug compound and protein target. And um, now this is the kind of base architecture that we propose, but we've also added two additional kind of add-ons to this to make it work really well. Um, first, we have to think about how to initialize this model, because for regular neural networks, we have the <coughs> We have the um, this theory that uh, in order to get a stable signal propagation through uh, a neural network, meaning if we have like a standardized input, we would also like a standardized output. Um, to achieve this, um, it's been shown that we need to initialize the weights with a variance that is the reciprocal of the fan in or the input dimension to a given layer. Um, this is what is done in the Kyming initialization strategy. But with hypernetwork, this becomes a bit more tricky because the output is instead used as weights uh, of this model. Um, and here again, it's the main network, the QSAR model, that we want a stable signal propagation through. Um, so here we've used the um, theory proposed by Shang and others. Um, where they derive uh, what they call the principal weight initialization strategy for hypernetworks. And they actually showed that we only need to adopt the, uh, or adapt the last layer of the hypernetwork. And I won't go into the derivation here, but um, the what, what you end up with is that, um, you need to initialize these weights um, with the variance of one over first the dimension of this layer in the hypernetwork, but also multiply it with the layer, the dimension of the layer in the main network that these parameters go into. So here, I mean, here I only show three, but this this part here is supposed to be a very, very long, uh, very high dimensional layer. 
and say that the first three outputs here go to the first layer of this model, then you need to divide the, yeah, then you need to initialize it with one over the, this dimension times three um, for these first few weights. And we also saw that this um, improved the, the, the learning and yeah, created a stable um, learning of this, uh, of this model. And the second thing we did was we took inspiration from um, my colleague Simonek and others um, that proposed what they call a context module. They proposed this as a way to enrich um, molecular compounds with a greater context of the chemical space, specifically the training set of molecular compounds. And they used this for a few shot setting of QSAR modeling. Um, but in our case, we are more interested in the protein side. Um, we would like to have our models perform well um, and generalize well between different protein targets. So we take this idea, but instead apply it on the protein side. So here's what we um, here's what it looks like. Um, we when we take in a new protein target um, and get this embedding, the context module, which is a modern Hopfield network, learns to associate this um, learns to um, enrich this embedding uh, with the larger context of all of the training proteins. Um, and in doing so, it um, this module um, draws the new embedding closer to the training set. And this is particularly good in the case when, through an inference, we get an unseen protein target that might have yeah, a slightly um, out of distribution um, embedding. This context module draws it closer to the training set and as such makes it easier for the rest of the model to actually handle this um, embedding. And with that, uh, I will go into the experiments uh, and results. So we've done um, extensive experiments with our approach on three different benchmarks. One that classifies um, bioactivity, we call it Lensalink. Um, one with regression of prediction of predicting binding affinity for kinase inhibition, um, called Davis. And then a third benchmark called uh, DUD E that is mainly used for molecular docking. This is a classification benchmark of classifying binding versus non binding interactions. And in this table, we see that. These three data sets um, are quite different in terms of number of interactions, number of unique drugs and targets, as well as active ratios and sparsity. Um, for example, this Davis benchmark is fully sparse or dense. So um, each drug is, has a known interaction with each um, protein target. And what this means, of course, when we test uh, in the zero shot setting, we hold out um, a protein target and all of the interactions for that target. But in the training, each target actually has a minimum of 68 known or exactly 68 uh, known interactions. This is not the case in the lens link benchmark, for example, because here um, a single protein target can have only one known interactions. Uh, or more than 4,000 interactions. And this creates quite an interesting um, difference between the two benchmarks and how this kind of, yeah, affects the training and affects this kind of model. The last benchmark um, is constructed in such a way that they, for every known um, binding compound uh, on a target, they manually pick out 50 decoy um, compounds that uh, are non-binding, um, but these have similar physiochemical properties, but dissimilar topology. And we believe, as we'll see in the results, that this uh, benchmark is quite easy um, for these machine learning models. Um, and um, yeah, we have uh, already, even in the zero shot setting, uh, our approach and previous approaches have really um, 
kind of solve this this uh, benchmark with very high performances. And for each benchmark, we um, pick out the or we find the um, state of the art model for this zero shot um, predictions, and we compare the approach using the exact same evaluation strategy, and we also include any pre prior work that was evaluated in a comparable way. For this first benchmark, we have two models using handcrafted descriptors, uh, as well as this DPCM model that I already mentioned that use pre uses pre-trained uh, encoders with a fully connected um, trainable module. Um, they found that the CDDD and SecVec encoders are the best in the zero shot setting. So these are the encoders that we have used um, uh, throughout the experiments with our hypernetwork approach. But of course, you can use um, anything. Um, you could use anything you would like. Um, on this benchmark, there are three different settings um, with the cross validation, a random setting, one that holds out uh, molecular compounds in terms of the of clusters um, based on the model fingerprints, one setting that holds out protein targets, and this setting is the one that we consider to be a zero shot um, setting. And there's also a fourth setting that uh, uses a temporal split, but this is just another uh, way to hold out um, drug compounds. <coughs> On this benchmark, they use um, they've mainly used matrix correlation coefficient to evaluate the performances in prior work. So this is just a score between minus one and one, where one is perfect correlation, and zero is a random prediction. And we also include an extra boost model um, that have the same um, encoders that we use. And here are the um, initial results. Um, and we can see that the hyper-PCM model um, achieves the um, highest absolute score um, in all settings. Um, but the previous work did not um, make the exact splits they used available. So we also um, conducted an experiment where we re-implemented the, the PCM model and evaluated it on exactly the same splits. Um, and he here we also see that uh, the improvement with the PCM model is statistically significant in all uh, settings. Uh, on this benchmark, we also made an ablation study where we consider each of the different um, methodological changes that we made. Uh, firstly, I didn't mention it, but the DPCM model was trained with um, basically, a threshold applied to continuous values to, to and, and it was trained in a classification way. But because the regression, because the continuous values of bioactivity was available, we also uh, we kind of changed the the learning setup to train uh, in a regression way instead. And we showed that both the DPCM model and our hyper network are improved when trained with a regression loss. Next, we compared, of course, the architectures, so the um, concatenated approach in the previous work with our hypernetwork, and we also see an improvement um, using our hypernetwork. And finally, we added this um, protein context module, and we saw a slight um, boost in performance for the hypernetwork. And next, we have this um, kinase inhibition data set um, of predicting um, binding affinity. Here, um, all of the previous models that perform well in the zero shot setting uh, are actually using more of a graph based um, encoders specifically for the drug compound, but also this uh, model here uses um, graph based encoders also for the, um, also for the protein targets. Um, so this is an interesting um, change here, um, but because of this reason, we also included a random forest and extra boost model that use the language based encoders that we have. On this benchmark, there are four settings. Um, again, a random one, uh, one that holds out drug compounds, one that holds out 
protein targets, but also one that holds out both drug compounds and protein targets. And in this case, uh, both the cold target and cold settings are examples of these zero shot predictions. So the ones that we are more um, interested in, the ones that are more difficult. Mm. And on this benchmark, they mainly use the concordance index uh, as the evaluation score, uh, which is a measure of the, uh, which measures if the order of um, a random pair of predictions, uh, predictions on a random pair of interactions, also corresponds to the order of the ground truth labels. Perfect correspond, uh, concordance is one, and a random prediction would result in zero, uh, in a score of zero. And here are the uh, results. Um, we see that in the random setting, which is the most um, the most easy setting, um, the one of the previous uh, models performs the best in terms of absolute values, but there's no statistical significance between um, our performance and, and theirs. Um, however, in the more difficult uh, settings, we see something interesting, which is that uh, all three of the models that that we add here that use language-based uh, encoders uh, outperform um, previ the previous uh, models that use graph-based encoders. Um, and for the cold drug and cold target settings, um, actually the random forest and actually boost models are already uh, are, are the best performing uh, models. But in the cold uh, setting, um, hyperplasium is the best. Um, Again, I think we believe that this goes back to uh, what I said um, regarding this data set that in the training data, every protein target has I mean, like has enough um, labeled interactions. So this could mean this could be the reason that actually these um, traditional approaches uh, already work quite well. Um, yeah, uh, question. Yes. Um, was wondering why there's this huge discrepancy between the cold target and the cold drug. Um, may that be due to the fact that you are not training very well uh, the um, the network, the drug uh, network after the initialization by the Hapa network. Um, you mean why the performance? For, for how you go this year. Mm -hmm. There's it's a, better in, the in this target, target is way better than the cold drug. Yeah, I think actually this is just that there are so few um, drug compounds in the data set. So there were only 68 com uh, drug compounds and almost 400 protein targets, whereas in the other kind of benchmarks, there's it's usually you that you have many many more drug compounds and only like a smaller subset of uh, protein targets so really there's not that many drug compounds to learn from and for that reason it's quite difficult to uh, for the models to to generalize uh, between um, drug compounds also both for the hypernetwork approach and for uh, for previous approaches you see basically that this setting is, is really the lowest, uh, lowest or usually the lowest in performance um, compared to these other settings. Um, at least I believe that that uh, should be the reason here. Um, yeah, but really one takeaway that we, we would like to stress here is that the, the language-based um, encoders seem to perform, seem to basically um, produce better um, embeddings um, than the graph-based um, encoders. But I should also mention that in, in the graph-based versions, they're not really pre-training the graph neural networks. In, in our case, we are using pre-trained uh, models that are just yeah, pre-trained on, on much, much larger data sets. Um, yeah, and in the final benchmark, we have a lot more, um, yeah, there are, this is quite, um, Cutter benchmark with a lot more um, prior work. 
We include some more traditional approaches like nearest neighbor search and forest, as well as an a docking algorithm. Um, there's also a 3D model, which takes into consideration the entire um, complex of the protein and, and ligand, um, yeah, the full complex and models that. There's a model that also takes into consideration the uh, binding pocket uh, of the complex. Um, but the more recent models are all versions of this BCM approach. So they take only the drug compound, um, the structure of the drug compound and the protein target and, and makes the, the models based on this. In this benchmark, there's only one setting, which is this cold setting that holds out both drug compounds and protein targets with a threefold cross validation. And previous work uh, evaluated the models using AUC as well as the rock enrichment score for different thresholds. And this rock enrichment score is one for, for random predictions, but the maximum depends on the thresholds. So, for example, for 5% rock enrichment, the perfect score is 20. And here, as I said before, um, both the hyper-PCM model and some of these previous PCM uh, approaches are really um, performing very well. So we see um, AUC scores of almost one, and actually in all of these um, different thresholded rock enrichment scores, the performances are close to the maximum. And so there's no um, significance basically between the hyper-PCM score and the this GAN DTI model, but uh, basically we just believe that um, this is a quite easy benchmark that has actually that can actually be solved using some different approaches. Um, and I would also like to mention that we provide a Hugging Face app for our model where you can play around with it. This is set up as a retrieval task, so you as the user can input the amino acid sequence of any protein target that you are interested in. We encode it using the encoder that we've used. Um, and you can then pick which um, data set you would like to retrieve from. And what we do is we run the hyper-PCM model for your um, selected uh, protein target and produce this QSAR model. And then we retrieve the top highest predicted either um, bioactivities or um, yeah, binding interactions um, or if from this uh, data set and you can pick between top five and top 20 and also download the retrieved compounds in SMILES format. So with that, um, we can uh, conclude that we have proposed this hyper-PCM model for robust task condition modeling of drug target interactions, which focuses on um, generalizing between different protein targets, which is what we consider to be the tasks, and to transfer knowledge between low data protein targets. And we've demonstrated the um, increased generalizing abilities with this model uh, over previous approaches on multiple well-known benchmarks. And again, as I said, Apart from the uh, advantage that this should have improved generalizing abilities, the uh, hypernetwork also um, has the computational advantage that if you identify a new protein target um, and there's no available um, training data for this um, target with a one-time inference of the protein through the hypernetwork, um, you actually gain access to this much smaller QSAR model um, that you can use more efficiently to scan a large number of drug compounds um, with then again improved um, performance compared to prior work. But a limitation is that the hypernetwork itself is bigger, so tra actually training the hypernetwork um, is uh, more computationally, um, yeah, it, it costs more. Um, but if this uh, zero-shot setting is what you're interested in, 
and we believe that this is still uh, worth um, worth it. And with uh, some yeah, some of the additional things that we showed was that um, these models typically benefit from training on the continuous values instead of just um, binary labels, if that's available. And uh, on the Davis benchmark, we also saw the improvement using language-based encoders over graph-based encoders for both the drugs and um, protein targets. So yeah, now I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you for the talk. Um, maybe just start with the question from Emmanuel in the chat. Um, do you see any correlation between the parameters generated by the hyper network for similar targets? So for example, biologically similar or similar in representation according to the language model? Yeah, so this is actually a really interesting question. We uh, have not explored this, but it's uh, super interesting to, uh, it would be super interesting to go into this to actually like visualize the, yeah, either the full parameters or some layer of the hyper network to really see if if these um, if if the predictions um, are clustered in some way that is similar to the the protein um, space, but um, yeah, we we have not done that yet. But it's it's really interesting to go into that, I believe. Yeah, I guess related to that, I wonder if you've investigated where the hyper network approach generalizes better than let's say the, the DPCM. Like is there a specific class of compounds, proteins, or is it like across the board slightly better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's that's also interesting. Um again we didn't we didn't look at that so far. Um but yeah would be super interesting to see. Yeah are you aware of like more theoretical results? about hyper networks that, that could make sense here? Um, so I'm not sure. So the, the theoretical kind of arguments that I proposed were not really like they are not, they were not like proposed for hyper networks. We just kind of uh, have drawn the um, yeah, relationship between these, these theories and, and why this approach should work. Um, I think that that these yeah these things have also been mentioned in other um approaches that that or in other papers that use this um approach, but yeah, I'm not sure if they're even even more um theoretical um arguments. Yeah. Yeah. Um any questions from the audience? Not that I can keep going. <laughs> Yeah, I can can add something. So I was wondering like was it worth it the complexity of having a hyper network compared to just like a simple concatenation and learning all together? Especially I think given that, that you are using the pre train and beginning. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. So I think that really depends on the benchmark and how difficult the setting is. So for example, in this uh find like in this uh, docking benchmark I showed, where there was basically no no advantage in terms of the performance, then of course I I think you should use like uh, an, another more uh, easily trainable uh, model. Um, but really, where the hyper network um, kind of shows the the performance is in these really more more difficult settings where you have those cases where you really have low data protein targets and try to learn from those um and that's where we saw the the greatest um improvements with the hyper network perfect thank you do you have any experimental intuition uh, with respect to like scaling these things in terms of size of the number of parameters and the number of parameters of the beta hyper network. Yeah, so really it kind of breaks down if you want to predict a bigger main network because that 
you know, like it, it doesn't scale well. And this has also been been said by by some other um, in, in some other work that uses hyper networks that really the the main network needs to be uh, quite small because uh, otherwise the hyper network just becomes huge and it also becomes quite a, a difficult thing of how to set up the hyper network if the output dimension like if the output layer should just be I don't know one million parameters then. I mean, you can imagine what that's like. It's like the output layer is one million, and okay, what do you do with the rest of the model? Then you would need like also very large layers earlier on in the in the hyper network. Um, we in our case where we had more like twenty thousand parameters in the main network, we could get um, we could get um, like it was enough to have like I don't know thousands of of uh, neurons in the, in the previous um, layers. So yeah, it, it doesn't really scale that good. Yeah, makes sense, thank you. Um, Manuel's asking in the chat, um, do you need to know the structure of the QSA network beforehand? Um, have you explored dynamic structure as a depth and width per layer? So in our, the way we've set up, set it up, we need to know the the structure of the, the QSR model. And we can only like we can we can only train it with one architecture of the QSR model. Um, but there was some super interesting um, work done in neural architecture search. Um, so but that was unrelated to drug discovery, but what they did was that they really had the hyper network learn the architecture of the main network using a graph um, a graph-based uh, neural network. Um, I think I might have a slide on show this actually here. So th this is the, the figure from this paper. So they they taking they take in different um, computational graphs, and this is the training data, and they then have a graph neural network that produces um, the the weights of of these different architectures. And with those different architectures, you can um, make the prediction. In, the, in their case, they were working in, in image-based or image classification uh, settings. So this, this was super interesting. Um, and I guess you could, in theory, do something like this first and then um, apply our approach later on in, uh, if you would like. Um, any further questions in the audience? Now that I have maybe one last question. Mm -hmm. So you have an experiment comparing like uh, classification versus regression. Um, do you know if that works better in certain data sets than others. And the reason I'm asking is that there are some data sets where let's say you aggregate a bunch of IC50s, but they're all measured with like experiments by different labs on different conditions. And so for those data sets, if you start regressing, you're actually kind of confusing the main model more than helping it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. That is that something you've noticed at all in your experiments? Um, I'm not sure. So with the, um, I should mention that the first data set where we did this comparison between classification and regression, this was a Campbell derived benchmark. Um, and I cannot actually remember if they aggregated, but I'm, I'm guessing that they aggregated, um, you know, some, some mul mul multiples of, uh, of interactions, but I don't think it's as extensive as you would say, like if you have more different, really different Labs and, and you aggregate kind of a lot of uh, of different experiments. Um, so I'm sure that would be super interesting also to compare. Um, but yeah, in in from from our results, I couldn't really tell you what what would be the difference. Um, but yeah, as you say, probably there are also um, cases where um, where you should only use the the classification approach. Mm -hmm. 